also the reason I chose to cover this topic was because I found that a lot of my peers were getting the facts wrong in terms of why we are where we are, um, <coughs> what sort of form of crisis of government. Uh, so in my opinion, I thought I have to get out there and tell them the truth. I can't just I can't just be like letting them say, oh, corporations this, corporations do that. I have to tell them it was actually the federal government raising the uh, percentage of low-income housing uh, ownership that they had goals for. And that ultimately led to the crisis, subprime crisis, which is where we are now. And I am a firm believer that where we are now is the reason not for Wall Street is happening now. I don't think this just happens corporate greed in general. I don't think it happens during a good economic time. I think it's right now because of the crisis that occurred. And I think they're sort of ignoring that. They're saying it's a general thing. But there is a reason they're here today, as opposed to 10 years ago when we were doing it. Or rather, 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and there's people rioting in Rome, burning and flipping cars. Nice and round. Right. Right. But I don't want that to happen here, so I'd like to talk about it. Exactly. Right. They're saying peaceful protest, like that's the message. Well, that's that's not violent protest. It's 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 not violent that makes it happen. I mean, mob mentality, and that's just internal flaw to the nature. I don't think that's unique to the Occupy Wall Street. Wait, aren't you guys the group of, like, disaffected people? No. I'm just saying, people who are disaffected for different reasons. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
five years down the road when you know, the economy is recovering again, you know, we're trying to back off going into the boom period. Uh, you know, the Occupy Wall Street is going to be a minor footnote that you can you know, maybe search up on the New York Times archive. It's not really going to amount to anything. Uh, other than simply being an indicator that you know there are a lot of disaffected people out there right now. Um, what kind of um, things do you see that um, you think business are necessary for the government to do? Are you talking about spending cuts? No, no, no. In, in order to deal with it, our essential problem is a debt overhang. The private sector can't spend. So there's two, there's <coughs> two broad sets of things the government can do. They can move debt from the private sector under their own balance sheet, a.k.a. run a big budget deficit. That's what the stimulus was trying to do. Or you could have higher inflation, which would raise, would erode away the uh, real value of debt. So the fact could increase the inflation target, say, 6%. Both of those would probably get unemployment down in a pretty short order. But the general public absolutely hates those two ideas. So is this, in, a, in a sense, is it the general public that's the problem here? Um, and it seems to me that a lot of that's probably generated out of, you know, political, political rhetoric of we have to get our house in order, we need to fix the budget deficit, when in fact, you know, a lot of the, like, what is it, the Republicans proposed that constitutional amendment in Congress to limit deficit spending, something like 18 million dollars. What you're talking about. And is, that, is this it where they proposed the constitutional amendment to limit deficit spending? No. It was in the, 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 it was in I don't, I don't have like an answer for you in terms of monetary policy, but I think that changing the political discussion would actually have a significant effect on what people, uh, what people's opinions are for those matters. I think it can't be disentangled from the way that politicians are communicating this message and seeing voter preferences as set things that determine what happens in the state instead of seeing them as beliefs that are shaped by politicians or by people in power, um, I think that you can get a backwards understanding. Okay, so we have five minutes left, so um, we're going to wrap it up by having, all, we're going to try to get all the questions here. So can you just raise your hand? Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to one, two, three, four, five, and then um, just please try to keep it short. Okay. Um, I'm Ben, I'm 13, I'm the Dr. Elmer. Um, you guys seem to feel that one of the big problems with the system is power is concentrated, power is concentrated, and that you can influence the political process, right? Now, I think we both agree that corporations and unions represent concentrated wealth. And corporations and unions both represent concentrated wealth. And both donate large amounts of political campaigns. Now, corporations are funded by borrowing and then making products, right? Selling debt, selling equity, and then they make money off of that. Unions make their money by charging dues to their members. And which person can opt out? If you don't like the corporation, you can sell the equity. If you don't like your union, you can leave and you don't have to pay the dues, right? Each of them can also return the capital, right? Corporations can pay dividends, and unions can say, okay, but you don't pay your dues. Each way that money gets returned to the individual. And I'm assuming you're okay with individual campaign corporations, right? Now, if you're okay with individuals contributing to a corporation, then to a campaign, What's wrong when they do it collectively, either as a corporation or a union? Although I'm not sure I I'm not sure I agree with with um, with individuals. There's a there's a cap to how much individuals can contribute to to campaigns, right? Yes. Yeah. I don't think I don't agree with that because um, not everyone has that much amount of money. Right, but um, let's say let's say leaving your union and selling your equity are both ways to get your money back. Or a union, not having to pay the dues. If you leave the union, you don't have to pay the dues, right? Wait, uh, sorry, corporations, if you, if you don't want... If, if you don't like what the corporation is doing, right? Evil Corp is donating too much. If you sell your shares, and the money you get from no longer being a part owner of that corporation, you go ahead and do what you want. But sometimes, for example, you don't have a choice as to whether or not you give money to a certain corporation. There's a, 
So, that, so it could actually be a very rational process where they rationally conclude a debate, right? But if you presented them with different arguments, they would reach a different conclusion. So the point was just that we should politicize our understanding of voter beliefs about the economy. And then in terms of whether Occupy Wall Street is rhetorical, um, I actually wouldn't cast it as rhetorical. There is maybe this rhetorical layer like on the very outside, where which I think has actually been more how the movement is presented outside of it than internally, they say, oh, they hate corporate greed, right? But internally, it's actually all about having engaged, reflective discussions. So that's why when people show up to our site and they say, what do you want? They say, well, we actually can't give you two sentences that capture everything we want. You would have to talk to us. And people have actually responded very aggressively to that. They say, no, you need to be able to give me a line or a soundbite. They say, yeah, but we actually believe that's a bad thing. We don't want politics to operate that way. So I think that the core of the movement is actually rejecting the sound of politics. Um, well, one thing I've been reading, um, you know, when I look at the different accounts of the New York Times, the Times, etc., is the accounts of people are leading right next to the protests say, hey, call it the people, um, down on Wall Street. And um, all of them say that, you know, that city is too loud. Um, you know, sometimes it can be rude depending on which city it is. Um, you know, I know that Occupy Dartmouth doesn't stand for this, but like around the world, there's different people standing for like communism, anarchy, anarchy. You know, some people have even said to hold up anti-Semite um, comments and things like that. So, uh, and I don't see the justification. I mean, you know, maybe if you guys had a line or something or a political message, you know, I could feel I can understand what you're saying. But I feel like it's not worth it, especially for the people living around there. I'm from New York City myself. Um, you know, two people through that, especially when you know there's no reason really why this protest started. You know, there's no reason, real reason for them to stop. Um, you know, and that you guys are resisting both sides of both parties. And I can see it as a moderate sort of uprising. But in the end, if you don't have a goal, you will. It's like you don't have a referendum. What is the point? I mean, I can understand why you guys are coming and saying, you know, it's not a deal that we don't have a point, but that is, I mean, what, how would you say, convince me why that's a whole point of it? Why, I mean, I think we do have a point. I just think it's not a uh, policy. You, do have you still think 